would like to welcome everyone to our um, Food for Thought, Fair Starts Path Forward for today, Wednesday, November 10th. We're excited to be here with you. My name is Julaine Smith. I'm the board chair of Fair Start. And it's great to be with all of you today to moderate a discussion about Fair Start's new three-year strategic plan and future. Before we get started and to help center our work and conversation, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are on the sacred land of the first peoples of Seattle, the Coast Salish peoples. And specifically, we're on the land of the, of the Duwamish tribe, who are the first peoples of Seattle. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish peoples who have stewarded past and present. And thank you so much for being with us today. You know, it's hard to believe that nearly two years ago now, just weeks before COVID upended nearly every aspect of our lives, that Fair Start was about to roll out its new three-year strategic plan. And when the pandemic hit, we put most of that plan aside for the time being and began to chart a brave path forward. Informed by our history and roots in job training and food security, we quickly responded to the urgent needs of the community. We indefinitely closed our restaurant, cafes, and our catering social enterprises and redeployed staff and resources to produce millions of meals to ensure our neighbors did not go hungry in the wake of the crisis. We recreated and launched training programs for an all virtual environment to safely train and prepare students for new job opportunities in the shifting labor market. In the aftermath of the murders of Ahmed Arbery, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, we deepened our resolve to become an anti-racist organization and fight against the racism that permeates our systems, institutions and organizations including our own. Now fast forward to earlier this year when our board, staff, and strategic planning committee came together to begin charting Fair Start's path forward. Today, we're gonna to talk about that new path, which is built upon nearly 30 years of listening and learning. It's also informed by the pandemic, which exacerbated joblessness, poverty, and food insecurity particularly for Black, Indigenous, people of color, women, and the LGBTQ communities. This plan moves us forward in our diversity, equity, and inclusion journey, and it grounds our work in anti-racism. Now, while there are bold new changes, our new plan reaffirms Fair Start's strong commitment to our mission, which is transforming lives, disrupting poverty, and nourishing our communities through food, life skills, and job training. Now, before we dive in, I'd love for Angela, Trisha, and Matt to introduce themselves and their roles at Fair Start. So first, Angela, go ahead. And we'll launch off with you introducing yourself uh, and your role here at Fair Start. Thank you so much, Julaine. Thank you for hosting um, this final installment of Food for Thought this year. And thanks to uh, everyone for joining us. Uh, Trisha and Matt, thank you for um, being on this panel. Uh, my name is Angela Dunleavy. I am the CEO at Fair Start. Um, I joined the uh, team and I've had the pleasure of leading this organization since 2018. Uh, great to be with you all. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Trisha? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tricia McKay Lincoln. I am on the board of Fair Start and uh, uh, about to become the uh, board chair starting in January. And um, during the day, I do nonprofit consulting. And I'm really excited to be here to talk about Fair Start's new strategic plan. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, Matt? Thank you, Julaine. Um, thanks everybody for being here. I'm Macri, I'm our Chief Innovation Officer, and I've been here for almost 21 years, which is uh, a little hard to think about, uh, but it's been amazing. And I uh, 
came here to help start the youth barista training program and have seen so much over the years. I'm really excited to talk about uh, where we're going. Great. And so welcome to all of you today. It's exciting to be able to present our, our strategic plan. So Angela, we're going to um, start with you. Um, and uh, what we'd like you to do is uh, share what Fair Start's approach was to putting together its new three-year strategic plan, um, especially in the wake of what's happened around the world in the last 18 months or so. So if you could share a little bit about the process that you've gone through. Well, thank you. I'm happy to do that. So I think uh, you, you know, you really um, nailed it when you said, you know, this this plan was um, informed by the pandemic, but this isn't a pandemic plan. What I think happened in the last 18 months is we have just been able to, you know, peel back all the layers of the onion of really big, deep systems um, breakdowns, really, um, in our society. Um, we know that, um, you know people who have been furthest from opportunity, uh, black, indigenous, other communities of color, um, uh, along with the LGBTQ plus communities have been disproportionately impacted by poverty, homelessness, food insecurity, exacerbated by the pandemic. And so we took this as an opportunity to, to really rethink how we're doing our work and where we wanna show up in the community. And I think for us to do that, it's that we really wanted to stay centered within the community and the people that we serve and really put the focus on how um, that work really ties in with the data that we see. Um, that, you know, what, not only what I just mentioned, but where we see um, uh, individuals in our programs um, graduating um, and getting jobs. And so we took this time to really analyze all of uh, that data to conduct some studies um, through great community organizations. And what we landed on was a plan that really focuses on three pillars, um, personal stability, economic mobility, and food security. And those are all things that have been very important to Fair Start for the last 30 years. And so what we did um, was work with our board um, members of our board of directors on a strategic planning committee, uh, members of our staff from all different parts of the organization. And then we really listened to community about how and when and where we show up. Um, and really having this be um, in some spaces um, work that we support um, and how do we bolster communities. So in looking at those um, food industry trends, um, we really have started to look at what are the entry level jobs that we um, know give folks the first best chance or next chance at a solid, um, you know, personally kind of being in this personally stable place where um, they can, you know, find stable housing, where they can um, start thinking about moving upward on that, on that path. Um, and so then we anchor that economic mobility and what's next. So how can we take the work that we've been doing um, at the base level at Fair Start, our culinary training, and help people find those transferable skills, get to that next rung on the ladder. And then we've always been centered around food and we talked about the restaurants. Um, we look forward to reopening the Fair Start restaurant, the cafes, um, the South Lake Union Cafe is already open. Um, but we wanna make sure that we are preparing people for jobs, not just in food service, um, but that can be launched by being in food service. Um, and so I think that you'll see, and we'll talk about a little bit more different areas where we might show up, where we're deepening our work, certainly um, around trauma-informed, uh, student-centered um, approach to training and job service, um, uh, social services, um, food systems um, change that Matt's talking a lot about, how do we show up really and, and do our training and support that work. Um, certainly that commitment to race and gender equity. And then I think, uh, focusing on where we need to be doing advocacy in the right places to bolster our students and the communities. Mm -hmm. so I'll stop there. There's a lot, I could keep going for it, but I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. It gives us a great foundation um, of understanding. Um, I wanted to uh, drill down a little bit on the area of uh, jobs and um, the job market that our students are, are faced with. Um, uh, and Trish, uh, Trisha, I'm going to uh, direct this uh, question to you, but um, the question is, you know, really in the in light of the fact that the job market has really changed 
dramatically since COVID. I mean, we can all recognize that, uh, especially in the restaurant industry. And so when you think about our training programs, can you share a little bit about how uh, Fair Start's job training programs are evolving to meet the, the moment uh, in terms of the need and the future as it pertains to our students being able to get uh, employment? Yeah, so um, Julaine, we're gonna be, as you know, um, essentially we're gonna be building on, on our core elements of the training that we know um, have been really successful with our students, but also planning to bolster the training um, and, and what we do to, as you say, meet the moment and the future. Um, so we learned a lot through our COVID experience. Um, we learned that there's a greater need for more competency using technology, um, yeah. better financial literacy. Uh, we also learned that um, virtual training actually worked better for some, some of our, our students, um, custodial parents, as an example. So we'd like to see where we might be able to continue some virtual training along with the in-person training. Um, we plan to continue to focus on personal stability um, and also make training, I think Angela mentioned this, even more student-centered, uh, integrate more trauma-informed um, training and also continue to ground it in, in self-empowerment. Um, we'll continue to provide wraparound support to really help program participants thrive. Um, and also an exciting element of this is really uh, reflecting our new strategy, but focus on the transferable skills that can be applied across industries and can lean toward, lead toward uh, career growth. So we're talking about food warehousing, food delivery and logistics, data management, and, and, and even onto grocery stores. Um, so, so exploring new training opportunities um, uh, as we're able to bring students back on site. Angela mentioned that we're gonna open up the Fair Start restaurant. So front of house jobs there, for example, when it reopens next year. Um, mm -hmm. Work in the food security area. Um, ensuring a readiness for jobs in the future food e ecosystem. So recovery and distribution as examples of that. Um, other opportunities we want to prepare for um, through carefully selected employer uh, partners like Mod Pizza as one example. And we'll be looking for more uh, partners to really uh, help uh, provide um, some training and also a, a place for employment for, um, for our students. All of this, we feel, are seeking upward, upward mobility uh, potential for our students. Yeah, We're also true. wanting to make sure we're training diverse populations uh, and those really facing disparities. And again, this just underscores our commitment to transform, transformational change and both for both the students um, as well as the community. Yeah, well said. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, it's um, a nice segue, I think, into a question I'd like to ask Matt uh, to address. And, you know, Fair Start's history for the past 30 years has been providing uh, food, uh, feeding our community. And we're going to continue to do that. And uh, even as we are expanding um, the ways that we can train our students, in preparation for uh, getting jobs in the uh, industry. Uh, Matt, I wanted you to uh, maybe share a little bit about how the pandemic has evolved our work as it pertains to us being able to feed the community uh, that we serve. So if you could just uh, share with us a few things that uh, have happened as a result of the pandemic and how it's impacted our mission to feed our community. Sure, and thanks, Julene. Um, pandemic's had an incredibly large impact on our hunger relief work and feeding the community, um, which has informed where we're heading significantly. Um, the outset of the pandemic, we rapidly shifted the org resources um, filling a need, an emergency need for meals across the region. Um, and then as we work through the pandemic to better understand regional food security needs, 
we've really been able to deepen our work in community resiliency and understand the community. Um, the operations team has done an amazing job of producing thousands of meals a day during the pandemic, really braving a first year, which was um, pretty fraught, um, grappling with a lot of obstacles to stabilize operations and ensure those in need uh, had the food uh, that they were uh, in need of. So really want to applaud the frontline team. Um, that work proved critical to the community, and it was a real, a real deep reminder of uh, the hunger relief work that we were founded on uh, and its importance. Um, that stability uh, in, that, in that frantic time allowed us for uh, the space to deepen our understanding of hunger in our community and focus on relationships um, and help feed people further from opportunity. Um, then we had a, the, the space and stability to think about some innovations that could further address food security in the region. Um, we found new ways to work with partners, some lasting, some new, that met food security needs demanded by COVID's impact. Um, we've been working differently with many partners in shelters and child care centers, a permanent supportive housing, uh, to serve individually packaged meals as demanded by COVID protocols and learned so many new skills that Trish was referring to uh, in the way that we're going to um, think about producing food and job training in the future. Um, we've reached further into South King County and met housing providers, churches, community organizations who were seeking reliable, nutritious meals. We explored these potential collaborations as opportunities to learn and to listen. Uh, and see how we could fill those gaps in food security uh, through partnership. Um, those relationships um, really helped us understand that there were still many people who were struggling with food security uh, and we were able that were in outlying areas and we developed a pilot mobile market uh, project to bring people in need um, more food uh, at more convenient times and places, really reducing the time they spent and the trips taken to food banks or grocery stores that are miles and many buses away. We developed a frozen meal project distributed at schools and food pantries. Uh, and that helped us understand how prepared meals might be received as healthy conveniences, providing additional time savings to individuals often working multiple jobs or with multiple priorities. Uh, we significantly expanded our work with farmers, grocers, and other businesses to glean and gather and purchase food that reduces waste and gets quality ingredients to the people who need it most. Um, and those explorations have really taught us a lot about our community and food security in general um, and allowed us to build a, a, this plan and think about those intersections of job training and food security um, and how they can weave together. Um, it's really the, a testament to Fair Start and our long history of innovation, piloting new projects and embedding our learnings into uh, the move forward strategies um, that will allow us um, to really learn from COVID and take this to the future. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, thank you, Matt. It's exciting. It's exciting to um, be able to uh, be a part of Fair Start at this time when we are um, innovating on even how we fulfill our mission, which is still the same, um, and uh, give our students opportunities for even more uh, economic security and upward mobility. Uh, so the, the two things are really working together. I mean, the way that we're expanding our, our thinking about the job opportunities for our students with our expansion of our innovation around how we can participate in this industry. And so it's, it's really exciting to, to see uh, what's going to uh, unfold and be a part of it. Um, so I have a question for us all to, to chime in on, and this has to do with a, um, 
uh, Fair Start's work uh, in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, which has been something that we have been uh, really intentional around for several years now, you know, even, even uh, before COVID. But uh, I think, Angela, I would say when you first came on as CEO uh, three years ago now, you know, we began to start looking at data. We began to, to see what the data was saying to us with regards to even our own operations and um, how people of color uh, were faring uh, with regards to our programs. And so this isn't anything new for Fair Start, a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, what I'd like to ask, though, is um, how is our uh, efforts in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion and reflected in the new STRAT plan? Uh, and where is Fair Start headed? Uh, from your respective viewpoints in this regard. Um, let's see here. Should I uh, ch choose someone to start? Angel, I see you. Right now. Yeah, I can, so I, can, I, can, I can jump in on this. I want to have you jump in first. Yes. You okay. know, so I think that it's really, I see this work really peppered through the entire plan. And I think that where we started in our journey was knowing that this was a long journey. Um, this Fair Start has been a white-led organization for a really long time, and there's a different level of work that has to go in to really deeply understanding that work, and I will just say from my own perspective, I'm still on my journey. Um, there's a lot of listening and, and learning that I need to do, and I think that where we really see this in the plan is, um, you know, one of the very first things that you'll see if you get dive down into the strategies is how we are um, connecting with our students through our staff and making sure that those who are furthest from opportunity have that stability. Um, again, we talked about some of those data points, but um, we really need to make sure that our staff can find that same level of, of you know, really feeling um, like they're economically stable, like their you know, mental health and um, physical health is in a place where they can then serve our students. And I think that that's an area that we have a lot of room for improvement. I think the social service sector in general um, has a lot of areas to improve in how our, our works, you know, our, our staff and, and our workforce um, really can help, you know, how we can help them. I think that um, where I spend a lot of my time is at the intersection of our work and advocacy. Um, so, you know, there is so much going on in our city, in our region right now. Um, we see it every day um, when, if we're downtown. Um, the, the crisis around homelessness and addiction has gotten worse. Um, and we, I think, where we're really leaning in is to support communities to tell us what do, how can we help um, in certain areas where, frankly, um, if, Communities of color know far better than, than we do what they need to, to bolster their communities and how can we lean in and do that work. Um, I'm spending a lot of time on big systems change issues, um, things around um, benefits, um, the benefits cliff, what happens to our, worker, our, our workforce once they get through our job training and then they get into the workforce and they lose their benefits. This disproportionately impacts communities of color um, and then I think that we also just have to take a hard look at some of the things that our own organization has not um, either done a great job of ourselves or where we're seeing deficiencies still in the community. We do see that our students of color who are graduating um, are employed at a lower rate than white students who graduate. And that's something that we really deeply um, need to tackle and get into. Um, that's um, really, I think, outlined in our plan, um, anchoring in that work. And so those are a couple of areas that I spend my time in um, right now is really focusing on the, the programs piece of it, um, how we integrate um, really culturally relevant um, content into our training and really meeting people where they are. And I think for a long time, the, you know, we talked about virtual training, I'll wrap up quickly, but virtual training has allowed us to reach a lot more uh, custodial parents um, we have seen an increase in students of color who are enrolling. Um, it's, you know, I think everyone on this call probably knows that we're located just down the street from a police station and uh, across the street from a federal courthouse, which is a real barrier to um, some of our students. 
Um, and so I, that's where I think that we'll need to continue to put a lot of focus and energy and welcome this community to really um, you know, lean in and, and put the pressure on us to, to do this work and, and to follow the data. Um, and I, I feel like the board, this board of directors has really given us um, the strategic plan that we've been able to deliver um, the opportunity to, to tackle some of that. Mm. Thank you, Angela. Um, can, I, can I pick it up from yeah, there? Yeah, you guys jump right uh, in. Um, and so thanks, Angela. Um, I really wanted to talk about the community collaborations that we've uh, been exploring. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the way that we're doing that um, is through uh, a lens of mutual benefit. Um, as we've explored our work and built new partnerships and relationships, particularly in South King County, um, we've really been trying to understand how to be a good partner um, and how to make these relationships work for both Fair Start, um, our students, um, and the organizations um, who we'd like to collaborate with. Um, we've been, my specific work has been focusing on the food security partnerships um, pilots um, excuse me, and like the mobile market, which has been going down to South King County and serving uh, people who have been furthest from opportunity. Um, and we've been doing that in collaboration with a lot of the organizations that I was mentioning in my, my previous remarks. Um, we've also really deepened our understanding um, immensely of farms that are led by communities of color in the region um, and what some of the opportunities and barriers to their success uh, might be. And we're really learning a tremendous amount um, and figuring out ways to support um, their growth and future success, not just buying uh, products from them today, but really thinking about what a future looks like and how do we help um, in mutual benefit those farms um, really achieve success. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. Um, Tricia, you and I both being board members, we have been the benefactors of some of the um, training that's happened in the area of DEI, but would you like to just share from a board member's perspective uh, how you see the DEI work uh, fitting into and supporting our um, strategic plan? Yeah, sure. Um, we are the benefactors of that, and um, we've been on this journey for a few years as an organization and as a board. And one thing I appreciate about this process is it started out as this bucket, DEI is this bucket, and it was kind of by itself and we wanted to figure it out and we wanted to go on a journey. And it's happened such that the board's journey has gone along with the staff journey. We have shared goals and separate goals and you'll see through the strategic plan is, is that equity is kind of woven throughout the plan. On the board level, we've been working really hard to diversify uh, racially, uh, lived experience wise, you know, on the board itself. Uh, we're wanting to make sure that staff has everything it's need it needs in order to execute on our DEI goals. And we're constantly looking at, you know, uh, our, our DEI goals, how we're, we're doing compared to that and, um, and how we're making we're uh, supporting the staff in its mm -hmm. efforts through programs and, and everything else that we're doing. So I feel like we've learned a lot from, from the staff um, taking the lead on this. And then we've also kind of uh, brought this on for our own work, not only on the board makeup, but um, how we're leading into our organizational goals around uh, DEI. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add one thing also when Angela was talking about uh, how it's being incorporated into our programs. Another thing I know of just because I've worked with staff on it is really making sure that we are drawing our students from the right places and making sure we're getting, you know, a lot of diversity and also reaching those that face so many disparities and so many barriers to getting the type of support that Fair Start can offer. And I know that's another element. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Actually, we have a question um, that's come in that Angela uh, is for you uh, and it relates to our students and their experience. Um, the question is, can you talk a little bit about what our students 
have been experiencing this past year uh, and how that experience has informed our work moving forward. Uh, the question, uh, the person who asked the question actually asked for some stories that you might be able to share with us of things that you're hearing about our students' experience in the past year. Well, I think um, it's a great question. I know, you know, it's been such a hard year for everyone and our students, you know, certainly um, have felt that in so many different ways, but I do think that there have been some some great successes. Um, you know, we recently um, celebrated 100% uh, graduation rate in one of our recent cohorts. And in that cohort, um, I think that where what we found is an, a, a real sense of community amongst those um, individuals who are who are in program together. Um, and the ability to connect out as things um, restart in the community, businesses restart, that they can con connect with um, with jobs and, and I'll give you one example. And I'll give you a couple, I'll give you some food sector, non-food sector, uh, two quick stories. Um, one, uh, we had a, a recent graduate who was somewhat fresh on, um, on his recovery journey. Um, and he ended up connecting with a graduate from like 2009, who is now a, a manager, a kitchen manager, lead chef at a large food facility here in Seattle. And not only were they able to connect and really um, bond as a shared experience at Fair Start, but also we have previous students coming back and really supporting our, um, um, our, our current students, our current graduates in things like recovery. Um, I think when we were at the, um, the gala a couple of weeks ago, Julaine, you, we heard the story of Omar who is working at Mod Pizza. And I think the really exciting thing about Omar is again, um, Omar is coming back in as a uh, Mod Pizza mentor and trainer to the students who are going in right now. And so our students have been able to plug in in many ways like they were in the past pre-COVID um, with previous students getting jobs in the food service sector. But I think that that um, opportunity to look at some different transferable skills and other um, sectors has also really opened, I think, the eyes of our programs team, certainly of our students. Uh, we've had our first job placement over the summer of an individual into a remote job, uh, which was the perfect thing, you know, it was such an individualized approach to finding um, the right career for this mother, uh, grandmother, I believe, um, so that she could take care of her family. And so I think that what we've really experienced and what we're trying to carry forward and what we'll try to scale is that sense of this personal individualized approach to training and where they're going after they leave our programs. And so that's some, some exciting work that's happened in the last year. Yeah. Always happy you. to share student stories. Yeah, the, they're so inspiring. Thank you so much. And there's another question that's come in that's somewhat related to our students' experience. Um, this question is, when do you anticipate bringing back students for in-person training? And what are some of the factors that go into making that decision? Yeah, so I'm going to just keep, I, Matt and, and Trisha chime in, I, that might be directed at me as well. Um, you know, the first and foremost, we've had to make sure that we can keep everyone safe um, from the pandemic. Um, so as it, we, you know, as we start to feel like we're coming, you know, light, light at the end of the tunnel, I don't want to jinx us. Um, but we are looking to bring students back on site um, in early uh, 2022. One of the things that we um, implemented that's new um, and is really impacts our, our strategic plan and our um, and really our the funding for our organization is the fact that we now are bringing uh, our students into the facilities as interns, paid interns. So they go through their virtual training program, the seven week virtual training program where they get stipends. We also um, uh, support them um, with all of the ways that we have before housing, um, some case management, uh, meals, um, but they come in and they'll actually work, you know, uh, as as interns within within Fair Start, and so we'll get that real hands on what it's like to be that first employer um, after they come out of their program, and I think that what's still sort of to be determined um, is where we should be training our students. Um, and again, to to that comment of you know not everyone who who wants and needs Fair Start starts resources can get to downtown Seattle easily. 
And so what do we need to think about in, in actually meeting our students where they are rather than having them come to us in all cases. So we're still in this real iteration um, point where um, you know, we look forward to having students back on site. We look forward to continuing with the virtual programming for those students that it really serves well. And then we look forward to exploring opportunities that may take us out, you know, and be able to do some training offsite. I think we're still just really, we have such a brilliant programs team who are so thoughtful about, you know, how they're showing up for um, uh, our students that we're just really going to take some time to think about the best way. Um, mm -hmm. But I did see on the chat, how are we measuring? Uh, we still are measuring, you know, next year we hope to, um, you know, graduate, you know, back up to closer to pre-pandemic levels of students coming in and going through our program, uh, graduation rates similar, getting back up to pre-COVID rates. So we are tracking that really closely. Great, great. Thank you, Angela. Um, Matt, there are a couple of questions I think that um, you would be the best person to address for us here. Um, we have, I think, a volunteer, a farm volunteer, who's asking a question about the farm volunteer gleaning structure and whether that will be uh, continued next year uh, and how uh, will it be evaluated? Sure. Um, so that has been uh, incredibly successful, and we, in, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't uh, repeat that next year. It, we, we intend to, um, and we're excited about it. Um, it's been measured this year both um, on our side from budget relieving food uh, that we're able to take in, as well as food that we can redistribute out to meal partners in the community, um, and the value that we're providing to the farms and the businesses that we're working with. And um, there's been a lot of activities that we've done, um, sort of transplanting and replanting um, that go a little bit beyond gleaning and really provide support um, through our volunteer network of the farms that I was talking about. Um, uh, and uh, we're really excited about it. So yes, it, it will continue. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Matt. And uh, one other question uh, for you. Um, there's a lot of food waste across our region, but also a lot of people who are hungry. Uh, can you share more about how Fair Start is working in addressing these issues? Yeah, it, it's really something that we're thinking quite a lot about. And I mentioned uh, redistribution. Um, we're really exploring and trying to understand if there's a way for Fair Start to bring in some of this food um, and um, stabilize it. A lot of this food is perishable. Um, we're thinking about how could we stabilize some of this food um, and have a longer shelf life and be able to integrate it into our meals and get it back out to individuals in need. Or like I mentioned, potentially redistribute some of that food to meal partners or, or others. Great. All right, well, you know, there's a question that was asked in chat that I think really is a great segue into uh, uh, the last question that we have for uh, the panel today. And it has to do with what success looks like. Uh, and so uh, this is a question for each of you panelists uh, to respond to, uh, but what will success look like or what do you anticipate it to look like? in three years. So three years from now, if we were looking back in our, you know, uh, hindsight mirror, and we were assessing um, what has happened as it pertains to the execution of our strategic plan, what would we deem to be success? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Angela, I know you've been talking a lot, but I'm going to toss it back to you first. Uh, but I do also want to hear from Matt and Tricia on this one as well. Yeah, you know, I can speak, you know, broadly. I think what success will look like is really um, Fair Start continuing to be um, a leading organization in our region for um, workforce development around, you know, not only um, food, you know, opportunity jobs, working with opportunity employers, getting individuals who've come out of incarceration and homelessness, um, who have experienced deep poverty, that we will 
continue to do our work that we've always done for the last 30 years and really land folks, um, especially those furthest from opportunity in a place where they not only achieve, but they believe that they can achieve great things and they go on to achieve great things. And that we are setting you know, individuals who may have not had uh, um, real opportunities to, to ever think about doing more than just that entry level job to be at a place where they can feel empowered um, to take that next step, to have living wage jobs um, I think there's a lot of work that we have to do in our community, just both, you know, systematically, structurally, um, to get people to that place where it's not just, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, really getting getting into a place of, of true stability. And that, that takes a long time. And I think that where I look forward to doing our work is, is continuing that, you know, that transformation when, you know, our team um, starts to really see our students come out of their shell, start to really believe in themselves, and that we follow them um, long enough to see them continue really, you know, go down that path. Um, so I think success for us will um, will will look like you know this new chap ne new next chapter of Fair Start, um, where we're you know able to to have more success stories that go you know just beyond that you know first job post fair start, but that we can really look back and celebrate and see people um, disrupting poverty in their own lives, but then disrupting it for their next generation too. Mm -hmm. And then, and I'll, I'm gonna save the food security part for Matt to talk about. Thank you, thank you, Angela. Uh, Matt, what would you add in terms of sure. what the will look um, like in three years? Yeah, I, in three years, I really am excited to see this plan come together and inform a stable social enterprise that is, you know, Julian, you asked a great question just before, um, really taking food that's available in the system and providing it out um, to those in, in need or in the community um, and fostering and supporting those deep community relationships to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that also weaves in the career pathways that Angela was talking about. And the laying out of this plan um, has me really excited about the possibility and the plausibility of those things happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trisha, from a board perspective, I'm curious, uh, what would success look like for you three years down the road? Yeah, I just, you know, underscore what Angela and Matt said, I'm so excited about the potential of having a variety of jobs available, you mm -hmm. know, and the right training for it for our students to not just survive, but thrive. And, um, you know, a great, a great a picture of success is more food security in our communities, like just more of it. Um, we just saw how vulnerable everyone was during uh, the pandemic. Um, some great closely aligned partners um, to help us on this journey, a, lo a lot of whom we already have and some new ones. Um, and also, and I think Angela might have alluded to this, but um, having Fair Start use its voice more to talk about what we're experiencing uh, and what information we can share, what our students are experiencing and maybe what you know policies and, and other supports could be out there to support not just our students, but others like them. So I think Fair Start is in a, in a great position to do more of that. And I think um, uh, using our voicemail would be a great picture of success as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Trisha. Um, I want to uh, continue down the same uh, thought uh, about success, but uh, bring it back to uh, the youth um, in particular, that there was a question that came in as to uh, what the uh, focus on our youth is going to be uh, and, and how is our um, our strategic plan centered around them. What would success look like for our youth program in, in the next three years? So Angela, I kind of want to circle back to you if you could speak specifically about uh, our youth and the students that we serve. Yeah, absolutely. So um, previous to, I guess this year, we had um, 
really functioned as a youth barista and a youth culinary. Um, sort of um, similar, similar populations of, of young people, but in kind of different tracks. Um, so we had the barista, which was very geared toward coffee. And then we had the youth culinary, which had a little bit more of the cafe skills, but also had coffee involved. Um, and so what we have done is really thought like why we, there's no need to have two of those programs. We're serving many of the same youth. So we've really consolidated that curricula to better deliver to more youth. Um, we are excited to um, uh, be writing plans to eventually get um, our young people back into Pack Tower. Um, I know that a lot of you folks who are on this call uh, like to go there as well as Houdini, but the other big change that we had is um, uh, launching a partnership with um, the Y Social Impact Center as our um, youth partner in this work. Um, they manage all of our case, uh, our case management, our housing, um, and services for our youth. And the opportunity to partner with um, the Y Social Impact Center is really one that allows us to expand beyond South, uh, beyond Seattle, and get into places like South King County. Uh, where we can reach the youth who are in those communities um, at, a, at a greater level. So we uh, see our Mod Pizza work as something that we will continue to do. For those of you who aren't familiar with our partnership with Mod, uh, we have a great um, internship program. Um, our students go in and spend, um, uh, it's, I think it's a 90-day internship um, with Fair Start supporting that um, work with Mod really kind of leaning in um, and providing the guidance and supporting our, these young people who you know, have a lot of, in, in some cases, have a lot of barriers. Uh, and the great news, um, we've seen time and time again that many of those same young people go on to get jobs at MOD. Uh, and I think it's really um, in all of our, our minds and our values and our, our benefit that we then continue to encourage those young people on to um, either the trades, some you know, post-secondary education, certainly high school completion is a huge, um, huge driver for us. Uh, I think we've all read um, you know, dozens of heartbreaking articles about the number of students who have lost education through the pandemic. And so we'll really be focusing our work in there. Again, this predominantly impacts uh, students of color. So mm -hmm. that just that that one change in the ability to, to get down to South King County will help us continue to grow our youth program. And, and this is, again, just a community and a group of people who are so smart, so capable, so ready to, you know, live their the best lives ahead of them. And in many cases have been dealt really difficult hands. And so, um, you know, for Fair Start to be able to be a, a launching place. And if you'll indulge me, I do have one, I forgot this like amazing story from the summer. Um, we had a student from our, um, I think he might have graduated just as the pandemic was beginning. Uh, and he had been working um, in Seattle as a barista throughout the pandemic. And at the end of the summer moved to Chicago to become um, uh, like a, some, a tech, an engineer in tech. And so this, the success really is there. I think really for our young people, there's such an opportunity uh, to connect our, those young people with education and those opportunities. So um, good stuff happening. Pack, yeah. we'll, we'll keep you all posted about the Pack Tower Cafe. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one more question I want to um, ask to uh, Angela. Uh, this again has to do with um, process uh, that Fair Start follows. You know, we we serve students who are furthest from opportunity and, and sometimes um, those students have come uh, from uh, incarceration. So they're, they're trying to get their footing back uh, under them, if you will, to stability and to upward mobility. Um, and so they, the reasons behind their incarceration can be varied, right? When you are, um, when Fair Start is looking at its students and um, bringing them into the program, can you share a little bit about the guidelines that are in place to help you to um, uh, make sure that the students are the best for our program and to also ensure that if there needs to be uh, considerations given to how we uh, interact with those students to make sure everyone stays safe. What are the guidelines around that? 
Yeah, so I think um, it's worth noting, and, and I did see the question in the chat, um, we um, do not work with level three sex offenders. Um, so there is a certain level that we just, if for the safety of our staff and our students, we just don't go there. Um, but, you know, we do work with individuals from all, all backgrounds who have, um, you know, come out of incarceration for various reasons. There are a few things that we really require, I think, um, to ensure the success of our students and the safety of everyone around. We do ask our adult uh, participants um, to be sober and to have a really strong um, uh, support system um, around that sobriety. We try to do the best we can to, to be that support system, but it really does require um, you know, folks to have um, a community around them when, when going through that um, experience. Um, and so those are really kind of the two big ones that we put in place to, to keep folks safe. Um, I will say this is, these are the same, you know, we've served individuals um, from incarceration, you know, who individuals who um, have come to us through different shelters. Um, and I think that what we're really trying to do is just understand people, people need sometimes 10 new chances and it really only takes that one, right? Like, it is worth it every time to give somebody, um, you know, that that additional chance, um, whether it's in our personal lives, whether it's related to Fair Start, um, and I think that we really do that and try to honor it in um, a way that, um, again, serves the individual for that individual transformation and change, mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, keeps our communities safe and and mm -hmm. kind of moving forward. Yeah. Well, uh, we have come to the end of our questions for today. Uh, but uh, before we close out, I just want to give each of you, if you uh, have any final words that you want to share before uh, we close out, I give you an opportunity to do so. Uh, if there is anything that you would like to say that you haven't had a chance to share with uh, the participants today. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, um, Angela, Matt, Tricia, for taking the time today to be on panel. I really do appreciate it. And thank you, all of you, for uh, joining us today. Um, as, you, as you've heard, Fair Start is uh, on an exciting journey. Uh, we're moving forward in bold new ways. The heart of our mission and the work, it remains the same. Uh, early next year, we're gonna be sharing our key priorities for 2022 as we continue to recover from the pandemic and move forward with our strategic plan. I just wanna, again, say thank you for being on the journey with us. We couldn't do it without you. And we look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you. Thank you all.